Good morning, ladies and gentlemen of the press. Uh, good morning to Trinidad and Tobago and viewers and listeners across the Caribbean and the wider region. Uh, on behalf of the opposition in the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago, we welcome you to our weekly uh, Sunday morning press conference uh, at the opposition leader's office in Port of Spain, Trinidad. This morning, we have some very, very important matters to reflect on and to speak to matters of politics, uh, economy, society that uh, have been engaging the attention of the national community and indeed the press. Uh, I'm joined this morning by the very dynamic and hardworking member of parliament for Cuba South, former minister in the Ministry of Finance and Works and Transport, uh, the Honorable Rujanath Indar Singh, who will speak to some issues involving labor and economy and the plight of the working class and the people in Trinidad and Tobago. This morning, as usual, we will have presentations by MP Indar Singh and myself. I intend to speak to some issues that are currently uh, dominating the interests and attention of the national community, uh, namely matters that have been raised in the Parliament uh, on Friday last when we met. Uh, later in the proceedings, I will speak to some of those issues and um, we, at the end of uh, this session, as usual, we will um, entertain and facilitate questions by members of the press and others who may wish to field questions to both myself and uh, Member of Parliament Indar Singh. So without any further ado, I'll invite MP Indar Singh to address us now. Thank you. Thank you very much, my parliamentary colleague, uh, Dr. Rudal Munilal, Member of Parliament for Orpuch East and the Opposition Shadow as it relates to national security and the Ministry of Works and Transport. And uh, this morning, I want to deal with a very important issue, an issue which clearly was a, a workers issue, a labor issue, and one that impacted upon the people of Trinidad and Tobago approximately one year ago. In fact, yesterday, Saturday the 25th of February 2023, made it one year when this country was subjected to one of the worst workplace accidents which occurred in the history of this country, that being the Paria tragedy where four of our nation's sons lost their lives in what we would term an unparalleled and unprecedented accident at uh, birth five on the Point of Pierre compound. And this incident is, as I said, a workers' issue, a labor issue, and one which has impacted tremendously on five families in this country. It has uh, been one of pain, trauma, psychological trauma, suffering, coming to terms with the day-to-day -day reality of living. As one mother put it at the memorial service uh, last Thursday at the Kovasau constituency office compound, 
where she stated that paying bills and dealing with the issue of day-to-day -day living is a real tragedy. And that person was Nicole Greenwich, the mother of uh, Mr. Yusuf Henry. And it is important to set the records and remind Trinidad and Tobago of the government's callous, contemptuous, arrogant, um, lack of care uh, of approach when this incident occurred and uh, how they treated with the opposition's call for social justice in this particular scenario. Because from day one, the government had issues of the government's approach to an inquiry, the government's approach to uh, the United National Congress's call for a commission of inquiry was met with scorn. It was met with, with contempt. The, the Prime Minister was very dismissive and flippant about um, the UNC's call through Mrs. Passat Bissessa. And as I said this morning, I will remind Trinidad and Tobago from a historical point of view where we were where we are today and where we need to go because you will recall that before the commission of inquiry was appointed a five-member investigative committee was uh, set up to investigate this incident it was announced by the minister of energy and energy affairs stuart young and it was the opposition through mrs Passad bisessa that exposed the government, exposed the minister for their attempt to rig the committee um, because we wanted this committee to be free from political influence, fear in its dealings, and from the beginning, as I said, the opposition saw a potential conflict of interest through the appointment of one Mr. Eugene Tia, the former head of the energy chamber who, although he held a professional expertise which required him to participate in this committee, he failed to divulge the relationship he had with the Minister of Energy and Energy Affairs as it relates to Minister Young representing Mr. Tia as an attorney at law years ago. And uh, this was clearly a, a conflict of interest and it could have led to a potential for interference and lend itself to, as I said, to the potential of interference. And it was the Prime Minister, in his careless haste to save face and the face of his moribund government, um, to put Mr. Tia in the firing line, and it caused the collapse of this committee. And then I want you to listen. It was the Prime Minister who initially chastised the opposition for calling for this commission of inquiry and had to turn around and resort to the UNC's suggestion to save the face of his government. And could we play the clip? And I want the country to be reminded of the approach of the Prime Minister and his government in the UNC's call for this commission of inquiry. Some people believe that let's put the courthouse with it. We'll have an army of lawyers. We'll spend hundreds of millions of dollars if we can, certainly millions of dollars, and we will bring it into a commission of inquiry. The main reason, according to our colleagues, is that we'll be able to call and summon and cross examine and all of these things. And of course, having done all of that, nobody's in integrity will be at risk. Nobody's uh, attempt to cover up 
and we have certainly get it done that way. So, the cabinet will be approached to appoint a commission of inquiry. We will make it a three man commission. The same even that BP or Shell or EOG or Total or ERI will go to to find experts to look at their situation if this happened in their company, the government of Trinidad will go there and hire expertise there to be involved. So, clearly, based on the utterances of the Prime Minister, you can clearly see that they had no interest and in fact they had to be called out by the UNC and uh, the words of the Prime Minister really sends a very clear message that they were kicking and screaming before they appointed this commission of inquiry and very quickly Trinidad and Tobago must never forget that after approximately 189 days when the Prime Minister announced the Commission of Inquiry, the Chairman of the Commission of Inquiry, King's Council, Jerome Lynch, lamented that the Commission still had not been afforded the necessary resources by the government to get the work running or off the ground. The chairman had indicated that only recently officers were set up, the commission uh, remained under resource and under staff, and he told the country that they lacked furniture, staff, equipment, and even basic stationery pen, paper, uh, and other things supporting um, paraphernalia to conduct their duties. And again, it is our responsibility to remind Trinidad and Tobago. The three newspapers, the Express headline was shameful stat. The Newsday's headline was no paper, no pen, no printer, no internet. And uh, the Guardian headline was no tools to do our job. Those who await answers as to how and why their loved ones died and to the general public, you have our unreserved apology that this commission of inquiry has been delayed yet again. That was the words of King's Counsel. Mr. Jerome Lynch. And also, imagine the then Attorney General, or the Attorney General, Attorney General Reginald Amor, who has the responsibility of being familiar with all the laws of Trinidad and Tobago, and to act as the guardian of the judiciary in this country, did not have even the basic knowledge of which office the uh, a commission of inquiry falls under he did not know that it from a gazetted point of view it fell under the office of the prime minister and he had to be publicly rebuked by her excellency paula may weeks to tell she told the attorney general that it was not her responsibility to financially resource the Commission of Inquiry. It was the responsibility of the office of the Prime Minister to deal with the issue of funding and all the resources that was needed. I think that um, Attorney General Amor will go down in history as the only Attorney General to ever be rebuked, publicly rebuked, by a head of state in this country. And in addition, to that, from a historical point of view, we must never forget, as I said, Attorney General Reginald Lamo, through Her Excellency and uh, the Attorney to the Commission of Inquiry, Ramesh Senior Counsel Ramesh Lawrence Maraj, under the bus as it relates to the government handling of uh, this Commission of Inquiry. 
And today, after a year has come and gone, the headline in today's Guardian speaks one year after, one year after Paria tragedy, families take to the sea in memory of their loved one, tormented by grief. And also, one year based on the memorial service that was done at the office of the Member of Parliament for Kuva South Compound last Thursday, the lone survivor, Christopher Bodram, stated very clearly, wounds still deeply open families a year after the Paria drowning. And Trinidad and Tobago, the Commission of Inquiry has held its hearing. Chairman of the Commission, King Council, King's Council, Jerome Lynch, has stated that the report should be finalized by Easter of this year. But it is important to note that he stated he can only, with the commissioners and so on, they can compile a report. That is all they can do, and they can submit it to the government of Trinidad and Tobago, headed by Dr. Rowley. And it was clear from the beginning that this entire country was refitted on a daily basis to the hearings and the deliberations of this Commission of Inquiry. And I am forced to ask the question here this morning, that if the United National Congress did not demand, did not call, did not beg the government for this Commission of Inquiry, everything that came out during this Commission of Inquiry would have been buried and we would, Trinidad and Tobago, would not have heard or would not have been privy to what transpired on that fateful day of the 25th of February and the subsequent days. Because during that memorial service on last Thursday, I listened to the pain, I listened to the trauma, I listened to the suffering, I listened to the hurt of Miss Salisha Corban, Miss Vanessa Cousy, Miss Nicole Greenwich, and uh, of course, Miss Catherine Ali uh, opted not to speak. And I listened to the hurt of Mr. Christopher Budram. And all of them who spoke at that memorial service reminded Trinidad and Tobago that their loved one was murdered. The inaction of Paria, the inaction of the government of Trinidad and Tobago made them conclude in no uncertain manner that their loved ones were, was murdered by the inaction of the state and the inaction of the Minister of Energy, the inaction of the Board of Paria, headed by Mr. Newman George, and the inaction of its CEO, Mr. Mushtaq Mohammed, and the Director of Terminal Operations, Mr. Colin Piper, and one Ms. Catherine Balkisun, and so on. And this morning, it is our responsibility to put on the table and squarely to the population of Trinidad and Tobago the need for continued answers as it relates to what transpired one year ago. And we will continue as a party that is rooted in labor, rooted in social justice, and seeking that ongoing struggle for transparency and equality and so on, we will continue to ask a number of questions here this morning because it is important that the deaths of these divers do not go in vain and it does not become a nine days wonder for the people 
of Trinidad and Tobago. Because we must never forget that the lead council for Paria, Paria being a state entity in Trinidad and Tobago, and the board being appointed by the cabinet of this country. The lawyer for Paria, one senior counsel by the name of Gilbert Peterson, stated that Paria had no legal responsibility to rescue LCM as divers, no legal responsibility. And in addition to that, it was Mr. Peterson who prosecuted and attempted to sway the commissioners to ensure that the families of the deceased divers did not testify before the commission of inquiry. And this morning, we want again to ask Mr. Senior Counsel Gilbert Peterson, where did you get your instructions from to come to this conclusion that the families should not be should not have been given the opportunity to um, to make their inputs before this commission of inquiry was it the minister of energy and energy affairs Stuart Young if it was not the minister of energy and energy affairs was it the board of directors led by Mr Newman George this question remain unanswered and it is our responsibility to continue to prosecute this particular issue and in addition to that we want to continue to ask again and put on the table was it the cabinet headed by Mr. Prime Minister Rowley because the Prime Minister would have been briefed on this unprecedented workplace tragedy? Or was it the Minister of Energy and Energy Affairs who instructed the Board of Directors of Paria to take the decision that it was cheaper to allow these divers to die than rather, rather than bear the financial cost of mounting a rescue operation. That is a fundamental question which has to be answered on behalf of the families of Kazem Ali Jr., Yusuf Henry, Rishi Nagesa, and um, Faisal Kurban, and also Trinidad and Tobago, because Paria is funded by the taxpayers of Trinidad and Tobago, and the board is appointed by the cabinet. And as a result of this board being funded by the taxpayers, the Prime Minister, and the Minister of Energy and Energy Affairs, and the Board of Directors, headed by Mr. Newman George, must account to the people of Trinidad and Tobago to ensure that there is justice, there is fair play, and there is transparency in this tragedy. And in addition to these issues, the Commission of Inquiry, based on the indicators from the Chairman, King's Counsel Jerome Lynch, that this report will be handed in by Easter of this year, again, having made the case or made the point that he can only compile and submit the report, the UNC here this morning is reiterating its position and its call. Just as we had to push, we had to plead, we had to nudge, we had to virtually push the Prime Minister through the door to announce the Commission of Inquiry. Prime Minister, we are saying to you here this morning, based on the pleas, the cries of the deceased family, and based on your responsibility to Trinidad and Tobago, 
when you receive that report, we are saying it is duty bound on your part to lay this entire report in the Parliament of Trinidad and Tobago. And in addition to laying this report in the Parliament of Trinidad and Tobago, we know that you are a man we cannot trust based on your track record and based on your utterances. So we have to put it on the public record here this morning. That in addition to the report being published in its entirety and laid in the parliament, we are demanding of you to ensure that this report is not sent to the office of the Attorney General for sanitization. Because based on the track record of your past committees and so on, you must, I am sure that you can clearly recollect you appointed a three-person committee to investigate allegations of sexual harassment at the Ministry of Sport when a sitting cabinet minister was under the microscope. And uh, a committee that was headed by one Jackie Wilson and included Fulade Matuta and uh, attorney at law Elaine Green. That report was compiled and today no one has seen that report. No one has viewed the contents of that report because it was sent to the office of the attorney general for sanitization and it was buried there. It was killed there because your government had no concern about sexual harassment, protecting a woman at the hands of a then uh, sitting cabinet minister and so on. And also, you really deceive the population in, re in that regard. And also, this report, when it goes to the Office of the Attorney General, we are very fearful that it may disappear. We do not want that to disappear because in recent times, a file in a very high profile case where nine men were freed of murder in terms of freed of, uh, of the charge of murdering businessman woman Vindra Naipaul Kuhlman in a civil matter simply disappeared from the office of the Attorney General. It reappeared by some magic and so on and up till today, we have not been told the country. We have not been told whether the loopholes have been identified, which led to the disappearance of this file, and what measures have been instituted to prevent the reoccurrence of files and so on disappearing. So we fear, too, that if this report goes from the Commission of Inquiry, goes to the office of the Prime Minister, it, uh, not the office of the prime minister, but the office of the attorney general, it may disappear from that office also. So we, we ask you to guard this particular report with the highest level of national security and so on, and treat it in that manner. And in addition to that, we call upon you to publicly state that you will ensure that this report is also sent to the Office of the Director of Public Prosecution so that it can be re reviewed based on the evidence and finding. And if there is merit for what we would term criminal prosecution, then allow the chips to fall where it may fall through the Office of the Director of Public Prosecution. And in addition to that, um, we must not let the Minister of Energy and Energy Affairs, Stuart Young, to get away because up till today, we have not been told why did not, why did Stuart Young not appear before this commission of inquiry because he was on the compound from day one when this accident occurred and in addition to tell the country what he did, what, mobilize, what mobilization of resources, what he did he not do, what was his relationship with uh, the Paria Board of Directors and so on as it relates to 
mountain a rescue operation or why did they, they did fail in mountain a rescue operation and so on and why probably he took the opportunity to hide from attorneys at law such as Prakash Ramada, Senior Counsel Ramesh Lawrence Maraj, Nairi Alfonso and Kamani Pasad Maraj and so on and why did they hide from the families of the deceased that is Minister Young and the lone survivor Christopher Budram and also why did the Minister of Labour Stephen McClashy why did he not or well, why did he choose not to appear before this commission of inquiry these are questions that needs to be answered on behalf of the people of Trinidad and Tobago because Minister Young plays a very critical role in the cabinet and so does the Minister of Labour as it relates to health and safety standards, workers issues and treating with the whole question of the work environment in Trinidad because, and Tobago because it is important again to for Trinidad and Tobago to be reminded that the Occupational Safety and Health Agency falls directly under the Minister of Labor. And from a historical point of view, those of you who can recollect very clearly that the OSH Agency failed to lock down this murder site and take control of this site immediately as required by the Occupational Safety and Health Act. Why did OSHA did not issue prohibition notices to PARIA and LMCS to stop all underwater work from taking place and so on? And again, it was only, I think, on the 14th of March, this accident occurred on the 25th, and on the 14th of March, the Occupational Safety and Health Agency took control uh, probably three weeks after the incident when they were supposed to take immediate control as uh, dictated by the Occupational Safety and Health Act of Trinidad and Tobago. And uh, in that regard also, while it is important to get the Commission of Inquiries report from King's Counsel Jerome Lynch, it is also important that the Prime Minister and the Minister of Labour and the Cabinet of Trinidad and Tobago must tell the country this morning, one year after this tragedy, where is the report of the Occupational Safety and Health Agency into this tragedy which occurred? Because the state, the Minister of Labor, the Occupational Safety and Health Agency is bounded, is mandated by this law to carry out under Part 8 of the Occupational Safety and Health Act notification and investigation of accident and occupational diseases. Minister of Labor, Prime Minister, where is the OSH report into this accident? And today, the United National Congress put on the record we demand because you see this government has a track record again of treating labor in the most contemptuous of manners, in the most arrogant of manners and so on. Because you can recollect about a uh, uh, little after, a uh, couple, uh, I think about a month or so after the Paria incident, there was an explosion at the Nikon plant. The Nikon, the Minister of Labor told the country that the OSH agency was investigating this workplace accident. Nikon has restarted operation. The Minister of Energy and Energy Affairs told the Parliament that 
they resumed operation and up till today, the Minister of Labor and the OSH agency cannot produce a report on this Nikwan explosion. And that leads to the very fundamental issue here this morning. We are here, but we need to go forward. The Minister of Labor, the government of Trinidad and Tobago needs to tell the country what have they done from a health and safety point of view. Paria needs to tell the country too in terms of ensuring that the Occupational Safety and Health Act is adhered to, the health and safety standards they have met the review and requirements. What have they done as it relates to reviewing the regulations as it relates to commercial and deep sea diving in the energy sector? Have the Occupational Safety and Health Agency, have they recruited specialized inspectors to lift the health and safety standards as it relates to um, adhering to the Occupational Safety and Health Act in the energy sector and throughout Trinidad and Tobago from a workplace point of view. How many vacancies are existing as it relates to inspectors one and two at the OSHA agency? Is there a functioning chief inspector at the Occupational Safety and Health Agency? And what laws do the government intend to amend based on lessons that would have emerged as a result of this incident, this tragedy at Paria? That is where we need to go, and that is where the government continues to fail not only the families of these divers, they fail, they have continued to fail the workers of Trinidad and Tobago. They have continued to fail the labor movement of this country. And they have continued to fail the population of this country. Because the approach as it relates to this incident is reflective of the poor leadership of Dr. Rowley and his entire cabinet. Not only from a worker and labor point of view, but in health, in education, in infrastructure, in national security. And this is why we are in this sad state of affairs as a country under the eight year of Dr. Rowley being the Prime Minister of Trinidad and Tobago. Thank you very much. And I now hand back this morning's press conference to my colleague, Dr. Rudal Munilal. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, <coughs> former Minister of Government, uh, Member of Parliament for the constituency of Cuba South, the Honorable Rujanath Indarasing, for that very comprehensive assessment as it relates specifically to one of the biggest human tragedies we have had in, industry, in the industrial life of Trinidad and Tobago. May I also commend uh, Mr. Indarasing his staff and the organizers of the recently held service and uh, memorial um, acknowledgement uh, over the death and despair one year ago of those divers and the incident. And uh, we further commend Mr. Indar Singh and others who have kept that issue alive, who have kept that on the spotlight, so to speak, to ensure that no stone is left unturned in terms of uh, bringing to justice those responsible for corporate manslaughter and murder in that matter where divers lost their lives um, as a result of what appears to be criminal negligence. And Mr. Indar Singh must be commended for his work uh, in keeping that issue alive and uh, providing the sincere compassion and support to members of the family uh, of those um, victims. So thank you very much. Uh, ladies and gentlemen of the press, I'd like to raise a few matters this morning with you. Um, I'd like to begin with uh, matters arising during the Prime Minister question time on Friday last, Friday 24th of February. I will not <laughs> begin with the most sensational issue regarding human trafficking and so on. I'll come to that in a few minutes. 
But I want to begin by raising another issue that arose there, which I believe that the national community and certainly the press did not um, pick up because, of course, uh, Dr. Rowley made a rather extraordinary and sensational allegation. And, of course, that uh, is, is, is probably more newsworthy. But I'll begin with an issue that was raised on Friday, nevertheless. It concerns bank accounts, foreign bank accounts, held by the government of Trinidad and Tobago. Now, it's very instructive that 16 questions, I believe, were approved for Prime Minister's questions. This is once per month this happened and so on is allowed for in the standing orders. What is amazing is that the third question on that paper to Dr. Rowley, as you will recall, he was at, at an unknown disclosure, disclo um, location, sorry. He was uh, uh, responding to questions from an unknown location. Uh, we were not told where he would be, but he had suffered, I think, from the fourth bout of COVID which is another matter of concern to the national community. And he was responding from a location somewhere. Um, there were 16 questions. The third question had to do with the European Union tax blacklist and the impact on the government of Trinidad and Tobago by way of closure of bank accounts in Europe. Do you know the sixth question, both filed by the member for Naparima, had to do with human trafficking? When Dr. Rowley had to deal with the third question regarding bank accounts, that led to a, an amazing revelation, which the human trafficking question, of course, he used to distract from that. And I will, I will deal with that first, because I think that deserves some analysis um, in, in the whole business, because the media, of course, did not uh, focus on the matter of the bank accounts. Ladies and gentlemen, it came to our attention, members of the opposition, it came to our attention that banks in Brussels were seizing and or closing the Trinidad and Tobago embassy bank accounts because of the European Union blacklist. They intended to do that, this by the close of business, 5 p.m. Brussels time on February 17, 2023. So at the close of business, February. Now, February 17th is an important day because that is, of course, fantastic Friday. There were issues of the, I think the Chutney Soka finals was in the night and Marshall Montano one show was also on that evening. But on that very day, fantastic Friday, our investigations revealed, those of us in the opposition were keeping track of this matter, that banks in Brussels were seizing and or closing the Tran Tobago embassy bank accounts by close of business. This was despite a notice in early January 2023, the banks gave notice to the government that they intended to close accounts as a result of the EU blacklist that this uh, government has found itself in. No action was taken by the government. No action was taken by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. No action was taken by the Ministry of Finance when they got notice in early January. So an entire month has passed and the accounts in, in Brussels were about to be closed. We got, it, we got this information live and direct from Europe through our own investigation and so on. This matter was raised with Dr. Rowley. He said something that was amazing. First, he acknowledged that this is the truth, that bank accounts were on the verge of closing. He claimed that it, was not, it had nothing to do with the EU blacklist. But it had to do with European money laundering laws. Now, to many of us, we were in shock. We sat in the parliament in shock, in awe, because that sounded more frightful than if it was being closed as a result of our EU blacklisting. What does the Trinidad Tobago embassy in Brussels has to do with money laundering? That the, the banks in Brussels will be closing the accounts, not because of the EU blacklist, for which we were informed, but because of European Union money laundering laws. And today, no media house, no private sector organization, nobody except the opposition is calling upon Rowley to explain why are bank accounts owned by the Trinidad Tobago Embassy being threatened with closure as a result of what money laundering laws is this embassy 
abroad our Trinidad and Tobago embassies are they involved somehow have they been complicit have they been inadvertently used and are now running afoul of European law and money laundering Dr. Rowley responded he told us something we never knew that indeed it is the truth that banks in Europe Brussels in particular to start was closing accounts he then revealed that they have been able to negotiate over the last few days to extend the deadline to comply with certain, I imagine, requirements. And that deadline had gone to March or May, we are not sure. But he did indicate, so he has, con he has admitted that yes, the banks are moving in on the TT Embassy bank accounts and it is a result of money laundering. But he will not say that it was a result of the EU blacklist. I want to remind the national community that the United National Congress in, um, in uh, Parliament, we have supported this government in, in to take legislative action to deal with our blacklisting position. And I remind you, the Foreign Account Tax Compl Compliance Act, FATCA, the Income Tax Amendment Bill 2019, the Mutual Administrative Assistance in Tax Matters Bill, 2018 and the tax information exchange agreement bill 2018 were all supported by the united national congress and the parliament of Trinidad and tobago so people who raise this issue and particularly there are some in the business sector private sector leadership and so on who believe that the, the unc is you know obstructing and we don't support i just named four major pieces of legislation which we voted in favor of to deal with this matter of blacklisting I recall when we do those matters come to Parliament, leaders of the business community would issue statements. Some of them wanted to meet us, and I think we met them. Yeah. And they come to us and say, listen, the sky is going to fall. The economy will collapse. Every bank account in the world will be closed if we do not support. Do you know Mrs. Kamla Prasad Bisasa, leader of the opposition, former prime minister, indicated to us that we will support the government on these measures to avoid an international financial crisis with the economy and we support it to this day we are not off the eu blacklist and we are being told by our investigations that the matters developing in brussels where bank accounts have been closed or threatened to be closed is related directly to the european union tax blacklist for which we are still on this morning i take this argument further because Dr. Rowley, in one moment of uh, extraordinary and a monstrous uh, type of uh, attack on the opposition, wanted to take attention away from this matter. I will let you know this morning, members of the press, you may not know, but in 2018, Scotiabank closed the Panama Embassy's account, Trinidad and Tobago account. We are not sure whether it was because of the blacklisting internationally, factor matter, or whether it was because Trinidad and Tobago was seen to be in violation of sanctions against Venezuela. 2018, the, the Prime Minister, in a response to me, I believe, stood in Parliament and said he had no care that we were meeting officials in Venezuela who themselves were accused of international crime, including drug trafficking. That is on the Parliament record. Today, we are being told that in 2018, Scotiabank closed the Trinidad and Tobago Embassy account in Panama. And it goes on, Panama is one, let's move on. We are being told now that bank accounts held by missions in Ottawa, Canada, in New York, have also been closed or threatened to be closed as a result of our breach of international uh, requirements, particularly the European Union blacklist tax blacklist so we are in a crisis where accounts in brussels canada new york panama have been closed or threatened to be closed and may be closed soon as a result of this failure to manage our business as it relates to compliance with international commitments for which the unc has supported the government on not once uh, one occasion not twice not three times on four occasions we voted in the parliament to support measures to remove Trinidad and Tobago from the European Union tax blacklist. And here we are. The government covers this up. They cover this up, not telling the population. Had it not been for a political party called the United National Congress, nobody would know that accounts in Brussels were either closed 
or on the verge of closing. You would never know that. So those persons who say the opposition there and don't do nothing and don't expose, please reflect on what is happening globally with this government's failure to manage our commitments to, to, on the matter of factor and global finance, I believe it is. So I leave that matter there now, and I go to another matter. And this is really the, you know, the hot matter of the day. The Express editorial today uh, calling the U.S. State Department must explain Express editorial. We have read that and so on. But let's break down this thing in a way that we can digest it easily. Ladies and gentlemen, an economic hurricane is coming to Trinidad and Tobago. A Category 5 hurricane. It has to do with a matter where Atlantic LNG will lay off staff. Minister Indar Singh, former minister, very interested in this matter. More people to be laid off at Atlantic LNG. The gas price has collapsed. They budgeted, I think, $6 around there. It is now $2 somewhere there. So the economy is going to be crashing in a few days when we have a second term. Um, second quarter report or so, as to what money we have been making from gas. Because the, the government of Rowley and Stuart Young government, they crashed the oil sector, went begging Guyana a few days ago to buy a set of oil iron at Point Pier. The Guyanese government told them clearly, no thank you, we're not interested in this oil iron. When we told them they ought not to close the refinery, they did not hear us. They went in parliament and announced with fanfare they are selling it to the union and the workers will control. They wasted two years. Then they go cap in hand to Guyana, begging Mr. Irfan Ali government to buy a piece of old iron from Point Pier. when the people say we're not interested in that. I am told that is the reason why Dr. Rowley left Guyana earlier than planned because he was not getting anybody to accept his offer of old, old steel pan and old scrap iron from Point Pier. He left earlier had to take an American Airlines uh, plane where he was embarrassed because apparently they asked him to go and stand up in the line to tell the, the um, customer service rep that he's Keith Rowley. He had to go in the line to tell the people who he was because nobody accepted his passport. Nobody accepted his departure card. He had to identify himself in a line to somebody with five O-levels to say that he is Keith Rowley. That is Guyana. He left earlier because nobody was taking him seriously in terms of purchase of the refinery in Trinidad. So he came to Trinidad when exposed by Rodney Charles on that matter of the bank accounts in Europe, came with what he considered to be a bombshell. Rodney Charles asked an important question, which Rodney Charles and Dinesh Rambali, I believe, have been asking for several years, for several months. Do you know in July 2022, Sunday press conference, July 2024, 2022. Press conference, 18th August, 2022. Letter to Embassy, August 23rd, 2022. Press conference, UNC, 2nd November, 2022. Press conference, December 11th, 2022. Press conference, midweek, February 23rd, 2023. Rodney Charles and others have been raising the matter of human trafficking. Let me remind the national community it is the government of the People's Partnership in April 2011 that took path-breaking legislation to Parliament to deal with human trafficking after the former PNM government that included Rowley, included Colin Embert, included many of those in the Parliament today, did not take action to bring legislation. We brought history-making legislation April 2011 to deal with trafficking in persons. That famous um, piece of legislation was passed by the Kamla Prasad Bisesa administration, a very serious piece of legislation dealing with um, international, transnational, organized crime involving trafficking in person, trafficking in children, women, for the purpose of sexual uh, work, for the purpose of forced labor, for dealing with persons who traffic in human beings to extract or take out organs to sell on the black market. We brought that legislation. Former Minister of National Security, Brigadier General, retired. John Sandy piloted that bill. Many of us spoke in that debate. Paula Gopi Schoon, I believe, responded on behalf of the opposition. Not Keith Rowley. Very interesting. I don't think he spoke 
on a matter of human trafficking in parliament, he was the opposition leader. I am not sure he spoke. Paula Gopi Schoon had to stand up and speak. Didn't make much sense, but made a contribution in the parliament on that occasion. Trafficking in person continued as a major focus. It was proclaimed by 2014, I believe, and so on. Do you know the last report done on trafficking in person situation report for Parliament is a report I have in my hand 2015? There is no report between 2015 to 2022 dealing with human trafficking. The United States government comes now and issued a trafficking persons report 2022. I have it in my hand. Short report, I believe 15 pages more or less. I encourage every member of the population of Trinidad and Tobago, every citizen, once you could read, go on the internet, get a copy of this report. It's very short, 15 pages. Read the report. Read it. It is in English. This report says, we are on the Taitu watch list. Taitu watch list. And I remind the population, when we were in office, we were not called watch list. We were on Taitu, but it was not watch list. We had been satisfying the requirements with law, with policy, with institution, with resources. We have a list of all the action we had been we were, we were taking. Establish the counter trafficking unit. Establish the task force, which are part of the legislation. Former Minister Gary Griffith had led the charge on this matter as well when he was Minister of National Security. So we are extremely proud of our work in that area. But it says here in this report. It's very instructive, and I must read. Corruption and official complicity in trafficking crimes remain the significant concerns inhibiting law enforcement action during the year. The government did not take action against senior government officials alleged in 2020 to be involved in trafficking. Now, it is very, very clear. I don't know what could be more clear than that. Senior government officials. Dr. Rowley is saying now, he came with one of the, the biggest, most abominable allegations ever made outside of email gate, which he made himself, email gate. To say, hello, Mr. Rodney Charles, that concerns people in the opposition. Now, the American government normally writes in English. They speak English, they write English. This is not a case where a report is translated from French to English, Spanish to English, Dutch, German to English, Hindi to English. This is a case where the report is in English. It says senior government officials alleged in 2020. Hear what? Rowley now comes to say it is not senior government officials. It's really senior government officials of the UNC in 2011, 12, somewhere there. But it's only in 2020 it is alleged. Um, in the seven years between 12 and 20, nobody alleged. It's only now. Okay. Dr. Rowley, listen. You are talking leave that word you are you are trying to say that the unc or mps in the unc it could be anybody involved in this matter and you raise it on friday but the matter is not who is involved or not why did you not take action you're saying the police and is the police investigating this how do you know it involves opposition mps or mp as the case may be how do you know that the police told you today i call an earlier here would Christopher to indicate to the country whether there's any ongoing investigation that involves members of parliament, whether in government or opposition, anyone dealing with human trafficking. Is there any ongoing investigation? And I put it to you, there is none. Absolutely none. That is hogwash because you cannot explain why your government has not laid one report in the parliament. You cannot explain why you, you do not provide resources. To the counter trafficking unit you cannot explain what you have done to, to prosecute to arrest prosecute and even convict persons involved in human trafficking but come with a load of baloney about opposition mp and so on involved and, and if we want to expose opposition mp in this report i beg members of the national community get it read it i will print it for anybody who wants it do you know in this report what it says i'm at page i'm at 13. It says here, I have to think I take a drink of water, Dr. Mego. To tell you this one. Page 13. And I, I just want to repeat and inform persons that the American authorities are saying 
that because government officials are involved, that has impeded law enforcement action. Now, who in the opposition, myself and who else, Mr. Indarasek, which one of us can impede the, the law enforcement agencies? What power we have in opposition to um, impede and hinder police from doing their job? What? Anyway, it says as pay, at page 13, very instructive here. It says now another major allegation. It says in July 2021, 30 Cuban medical professionals followed a May 20 group of 12 medical professionals to the country, Tran and Tobago, to assist with pandemic and so on. Cuban medical professionals may have been forced to work by the Cuban government. Forced to work. That is an issue. But Dr. Rowley don't want to focus on that. He want to focus on the opposition. On who in the opposition in Movalang they say involved here or involved there. When the police have absolutely no ongoing investigation. None on any member of the United National Congress involved in that. They have none. I don't know if they might open one tonight when I don't talk, but they have none. The, the report says corruption in police and immigration has been associated with facilitating labor and sex trafficking. Observers report that law enforcement and security officials are implicated in trafficking, including Coast Guard officials who facilitate the transit of women and girls from Venezuela to Trinidad and Tobago. Immigration and customs officers ensure that women and girls arrive and receive entry and members of the police who accept bribes to facilitate transport to houses across the country. That is an amazing finding, observation by the United States Authority. Keith Rowley is not concerned with this, you know. He cannot explain what he has done as head of the National Security Council to clamp down on corruption in the police in the Coast Guard, in the Army, in government official, in government circles. What is the status of Cuban medical professionals who the Americans are now saying may have been forced to come to Trinidad and Tobago as part of forced labor in violation of the laws of Trinidad and Tobago human trafficking law? No point about this, Dr. Rowley. Tell us, are you aware of Cuban officials, medical or otherwise, who are being forced to work in Toronto Tobago as a result of arrangements with their government or any government. It is well known in this country, those of us who are MPs, we know people are involved in this trade. And at the lower end, you have pimps and you have persons who move around with persons and offer for sale. I notice a former cabinet colleague is saying that, uh, he's saying that when he was in government, uh, our former colleague in a temperature, I think of minus one degree in Canada, woke up, drank some hot chocolate and came out within hours to say Rowley is right. Uh, when he was in government, somebody brought companionship to him. Now, why they would bring for him, I don't know. But they brought for him and he rejected. Now, that is to make a mockery and trivialize human trafficking. It have, in Trinidad and Tobago, as elsewhere in the Caribbean and the region, there are people who operate as micro-entrepreneurs and they move around with persons and so on. We are talking about organized transnational crime involving top honchos who bring persons from Venezuela and elsewhere, seize their passport, keep them in subhuman conditions, um, labor, uh, force them to work, force children to be involved in the sex trade. That is what we are talking about. I want to ask Keith Rowley something. Something came to my attention. Keith Rowley was invite, not invited, he attended very few engagements, as he said, but one involved a party in Port of Spain. I am told that entrepreneurs involved in the trade actually attended that party as well. A southern, prominent southern businessman, along with another entrepreneur involved in that trade, attended. And they were seen in contact with the prime minister. They were seen speaking to him. And they had brought as well persons who may be offered for companionship. And they may have offered the Prime Minister in front of all the guests at that party. I am told the Prime Minister, being a decent man, as the former minister in Canada, shoot him away and said, no, he was not interested. Maybe at that time, he was not interested. I am told. I wasn't there, but I am told by persons who were there that they were entrepreneurs in the party speaking to Dr. Keith Rowley as Prime Minister. And they may have offered him some, you know, Service. 
But being the decent man that he is, decided at that moment he was not interested. Not interested. But that happens in Trinidad and Tobago. So are you going to now deal with those persons if you deem them human traffickers? Are you going to deal with persons who are known to you in the business community and who are known to be involved in offering companionship and so on? Will you be dealing with them as human traffickers? Don't trivialize these issues. Don't trivialize these issues and make them pedestrian. Deal with the report. Deal with the urgent matters raised in the report. And the report speaks to issues here. Look at it here. The, the, the problem is we, are, we don't have the resources to identify and protect victims. Law enforcement is weak in proactively identifying, obtaining, preserving, and corroborating evidence of trafficking. We need improved cooperation between the counter-trafficking unit, the judiciary, and the NGOs. We need to strengthen oversight, regulation, and inspection of private labor recruitment agencies, domestic work situations, including license division, increased support for persons who are victims. There's a list of things to be done that the government is not doing. But you jump up in parliament to say um, uh, we, we, uh, opposition MP and opposition MP is involved. If you have evidence, take it to the police. Today we call upon the United States as well. You know, where you, you're making the claim of government officials. We don't operate in this country, whatever you think. We don't call opposition MPs government officials. In fact, do you know we at one time opposition MPs used to do letters on letterheads? With the coat of arms. Do you know they stop that? We now do letter a letterhead with the parliament. Because we are not government officials. We are not. We cannot go and command any uh, law enforcement agency to do anything. We don't operate with the, the counter trafficking unit under our ministry as opposition members. And today I call upon the prime minister. Tell us why the counter trafficking unit cannot report to parliament in seven years. That is under the ministries headed by Stuart Young and Fitzgerald Hines. So I will leave this trafficking business and so on there for now. But only to say that the United National Congress has a proud record of supporting and passing a historic legislation to deal with human trafficking. Of sending reports to Parliament since 2015, the last year we were in office. We have a proud track record of defending persons involved of protecting victims, of giving resources to the police to deal with human trafficking. Human trafficking involves grabbing people and taking away their organs, kidney and liver and heart and so on, to be sold on the black market. What have you been doing to meet and treat with that crisis? What have you been doing to support the institutions? We leave that there. And the last matter I would raise, brothers and sisters, the last matter I would raise is the matter of the missing ammunition. I had raised two weeks ago, I think, in a press conference, a, an amazing revelation that 500 rounds of 9mm ammunition went missing from the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service. I will update that matter this morning. I think people are familiar with it. To indicate by letter of 17 February, which is recently, 2023, the police service has now written to the lawyers of a private um, dealer in ammunition and weapons and so on. And here's what the police are saying. Look the letter here now. This is the letter. The police are saying, reference is made to your letter and so on. Please be advised that we are instructed that an investigation was launched relative to the alleged missing 500 rounds of 9mm ammunition. And we are awaiting the outcome of the same to provide responses. The, the, the dealer in ammunition and weapons is suing the police. Contempt proceedings will start in a few days where the police cannot find 900 bullets, so to speak. That is nine, uh, 500 bullets, so to speak. That is 500 murder, 500 kidnapping, 500 home invasion, 500 robberies that can take place because the police, quote unquote, lost 500 rounds of ammunition. Mrs. Christopher has called for an investigation. M Madam Commissioner of Police, tomorrow you will attend at the Joint Select Committee of Parliament on National Security. I pray to God you don't have an emergency today as you had on the last occasion that you could not attend. 
tomorrow when you meet me, I will also ask you, what is the result of this? It is taking far too long. How can the police service take 14 days or more to find out where 500 rounds of ammunition went? It is either it is missing, stolen, or it is not. And if you find it, return it to the owner as per the judgment and ruling of the court, as per the order of the court. So tomorrow, Mrs. Haywood Christopher, when you appear at the Joint Select Committee on National Security, 1 to 30 p.m. at the Parliament, I'm reminding you, in case you forget, we will be focusing on this matter as well. And the final letter I want to show members of the public is another matter related to this matter of firearms and ammunition and so on. And you have to understand what is happening. This is a letter imagining the Minister of National Security, one Fitzgerald Ethelbert Hines. That's the man. Mr. Hines has written a letter dated January 6, 2022. Is in my hand now. In my hand. And you will get it on your screen, I suspect. Could you imagine Mr. Hines as a minister wrote to Mr. Raymond Craig, retired assistant commissioner of police, who is a civilian. He's retired, Mr. Craig. And he's saying in this letter, I am pleased to advise that the Honorable Prime Minister and Chair of National Security, Keith Rowley, has agreed for your appointment to serve on a committee to conduct an audit of the firearms registry of the Toronto Tobago Police Service. He gives the name of the other people, Leonard Charles, Mr. Wellington Virgil, also known in circles, all retired police. So you went and you got the retired police, but the Minister of National Security in violation of the Constitution, the Toronto Tobago Police Service is protected in the Constitution. No minister, no prime minister can direct them. They act independently. It is a pillar, a fundamental pillar in the Constitution to separate law enforcement and insulate them. In fact, there's a famous court judgment, I believe, from the Privy Council dealing with this matter that says that politicians cannot and must not influence police service service commissions, police commission, and so on. Here, the minister appointing civilians to investigate a department of the Toronto Tobago Police Service. This is unlawful, unconstitutional. This is undermining the constitution, undermining the Toronto Tobago Police Service. They have no authority to investigate any unit of the TTPS. If you want to investigate the TTPS, you have to do it according to law, through a commission of inquiry through the TTPS themselves having an independent unit to go and investigate through the Police Complaints Authority. Those are the legal uh, institutions that are, can investigate police. You cannot walk down the road and pick up three retirees, ask them what they're doing if they're busy. They say, we're doing nothing, boss. They say, come investigate the TTPS. That's against the Constitution. And we have it now in black and white. Signed, I will show you the signature. Signature of Minister Ethelbert Hines. Signature authorizing civilians to interfere with the Toronto Tobago Police Service, which is protected in the Constitution. And that is why I suspect they did not want Gary Griffith in office, because Mr. Griffith was very clear that you cannot, you cannot investigate the police service as civilians. And no minister or prime minister can authorize that. We have sat, myself included, five years on the National Security Council. Not once we could have called in private citizens and say, go and investigate the police service. You cannot do that. You cannot do it. And this is a matter now before I believe the courts, and the court will determine this matter. So those are the issues that I wish to raise at this time. And we are free, of course, to take some questions from members of the public. Thank you very much, members of the press and members of the national community. Um. MP Nursing, um, you mentioned the Commissioner for Inquiry and the report. Um, do you think that the Prime Minister has not commented on it because he intends to not make the report public and effectively bury it? Well, the track record of the government speaks volumes in terms of how they have conducted their affairs and business for the last eight years. They have behaved in a very unconstitutional manner. They have abused uh, the constitution of the country, taking into consideration the signals that we have seen from the report that was done 
on sexual harassment into the Ministry of Sport. That report was sent to the Office of the Attorney General for sanitization. It has been buried. Um, the Nikon Explosion Report, the Occupational Safety and Health Agency, has failed to provide a report. So based on the track record of the government, because the government did not want this commission of inquiry from the beginning, it was the UNC led by Mrs. Passat Bissessa who had to demand of the government, push the government through the door, prod, beg, curse, and so on. And the clip at the beginning of this press conference displayed the contempt that the Prime Minister had for this commission of inquiry. So I am of the firm belief because why did not the Minister of Energy and Energy Affairs go before the Commission of Inquiry? Why did not the Minister of Labor go before the Commission of Inquiry? Why did not the Chairman of the Board of Directors go fail to go before the Commission of Inquiry? Did they have uh, something to hide? Birds of a feather flock together and at the end of the day, we believe that the government had something to hide based on what transpired at Paria. And it may well be that they will bury this report. Um, you mentioned that there has one year later, no OSH report. Um, there hasn't been an investigation by the TPS either. Um, are you concerned that perhaps um, with us not knowing exactly what happened on that day, another major accident like this could occur? Yes, based on the fact that uh, I said we were um, one year has elapsed and the government continues to remain very silent um, we, in terms of where the OSH agency is in terms of conducting or concluding a report uh, and finalizing a report and making it public. The, this was a site where four persons died and the TTPS was involved preliminary uh, in terms of its initial work. I could remember former uh, Commissioner uh, Jacobs had indicated that. And uh, message uh, information coming to me as I looked at my phone, I just want to indicate um, here are some more information from you. All of the senior managers at Paria were not on site due to a system of work. So it took them, the senior managers, they arrived five hours after that incident occurred. Uh, five hours was lost and the Paria lower level health and safety officers were holding on till senior Paria managers arrived. And uh, I am told that um, uh, in addition to that, the key or critical staff at Paria was missing and the whole health and safety uh, system collapsed on, 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 on that day. That is information that came to me via uh, a WhatsApp as this um, press conference was in progress. So from where I sit, the government remains, continues to remain silent. The Minister of Labor remains silent. The Minister of Energy and Energy Affairs, the line minister with responsibility for Paria continues to remain silent. The board of directors headed by Mr. Newman George continues to remain silent. And we do not know where the report of the OSH agency is. Have they concluded? Is it still in progress? And what are the recommendations of the OSH agency in terms of lifting the bar as it relates to health and safety standards, not only at Paria, but at throughout the work environment in Trinidad and Tobago. Um, did the MP Darcy follow the from the news day? Um, the first thing I want to ask is or say is that when I had looked through the bundles of documents um, on the Commission of Inquiry's website, there is a document by Incortec, which was a company hired by the OSH agency to look into the incident, and then that document was further used during the Commission of Inquiry as to what had happened. So I don't know if um, you think that 
OSHA should issue a second report because they did in fact hire a company to do a report on you. OSH, the OSH agency is bounded by the Occupational Safety and Health Act of Trinidad and Tobago. The OSH agency is created by this particular piece of legislation. Part 8 of this act states the notification and investigation of accidents and occupational um, diseases. If indeed the OSH agency hired uh, the firm that you have alluded to, it means that the OSH agency did not have uh, specialized staff to conduct this investigation. And if indeed this firm conducted this report, where is this report? The, the OSH agency cannot just subcontract or hire an agency and fail to tell the taxpayers of this country how much they paid for that report and the Minister of Labor is duty bound to ensure that that report, if indeed it has been finalized by this agency that you alluded to, is handed in in the interest of transparency and good governance and so on. And uh, indeed, uh, the question further begs itself, has the OSH agency remedied itself in the context of having specialized, have they recruited specialized staff to deal to with lifting the bar as it relates to health and safety standards in the energy sector. There is work continuing as it relates to commercial diving, deep sea diving, where are the regulations, what laws are going to be amended and so on, where are those recommendations. Are we operating in VAPs? Are we operating in a vacuum? The workforce continues not only in the energy sector, but throughout Trinidad and Tobago, and we do not know what is being done or what has been done or what has been put in place to avoid a repeat of this national tragedy, corporate manslaughter, criminal negligence at the end of the day. The deaths of Rishi Nagesa, Kazem Ali Jr., Yusuf Henry, and Faisal Korban must not go in vain, and the trauma of Christopher Budram must not be allowed to go undone in this country. Um, the next question, you had said something about um, who gave Paria instructions about not mounting a rescue event because it was too expensive. That's the first that I've heard that time. I am saying, I am putting out the, the, the Commission of Inquiry has come to an end, and there are a number of questions that are unanswered. And the opposition is asking the question, putting it out in the public domain. Did who instructed who not to mount a rescue operation? Or did they come to, let them refute it, let them say, did the Minister of Energy instruct the Board of Directors of Paria? Or did the Board of Directors of Paria come to the conclusion that it was cheaper not to mount a rescue oper rather not to mount a rescue operation and allow these men to die. Somebody has to answer the issues that the opposition is concerned about because as I said, this is a workers issue. This is a labor issue. The labor movement, the trade union movement one year after cannot allow this to go undone and remain silent on this particular issue. My two questions for my Bumunela. Thank you very much. Um, you briefly mentioned the statement made by former MP, former UNC politician, Devan Maraj. Um, so, in addition to him saying that he had been offered the comfort, um, he also said that uh, investigation was carried out while he was part of the party, while it was part of the, while it was in government. Um, could you say whether or not this was carried out and what, what may have been the results? If you knew about it, of course. Well, first, let me say um, that I'm not aware of any investigation. Um, it certainly was not an investigation of any cabinet or any 
cabinet um, business. I'm not sure if um, former Minister Maraj may have conducted his own inquiry into any matter. Um, if he did, then surely the, the ministry will have a report, and that report could be found. And if there's any claim of wrongdoing or criminal conduct, that such a report ought to go to the police. Um, government practice is that if a minister conducts an investigation of any kind, the report is filed at the ministry if it involves criminal wrongdoing. I'll give you an example. When I was Minister of Housing, there were several reports conducted over the period of persons who it was alleged were involved in selling houses illegally or obtaining money by fraud, for example, with the promise of giving people housing. Once a report like that is done by the ministry and you read that report and it suggests criminal wrongdoing, it was always passed to the police for investigation and the police would deal with it. And in fact, I, I could tell you during the time we were there, a couple of people were arrested and charged uh, for fraudulently accepting monies for homes and so on. So if that was done, Minister Maraj ought to have sent that report or ought to have ensured that the report is go has gone to the police. But that certainly was not a government matter or a cabinet matter. Um, if it is that, so uh, I cannot now accuse Minister Maraj of suppressing information all these years because uh, to my knowledge, when we look at there was some inquiry in 2011, 2012, I believe. And um, I cannot accuse Mr. Maraj of suppressing information or knowledge of criminal wrongdoing and waiting until Dr. Rowley made such an abominable allegation in Parliament Friday last to come out and confirm that. Um, but certainly, if it was any criminal wrongdoing, it ought to have been passed on to the police because as ministers, we know that we ought not to have reports in our possession that deal with criminal wrongdoing and keep it and hide it and keep it secret and wait for 11 years later to say, aha, I remembered. Um, so I'm not aware of it to answer the question directly. But what I'm aware of is that these are very serious matters. And it is not a matter. I think there's a, an attempt to trivialize the matter now. There's an attempt to almost make it a joke as to you walk down the road and somebody come up to you and solicit you and that is human trafficking and criminal action and so on. That is not the issue. We are dealing here with a very serious transnational, internationally coordinated business of human trafficking. And I, as I said before, uh, Mr. Rowley should tell us whether anyone approached him at the recent Portisman party and made a what is called a service offer to him. Did they do it? And are they human traffickers? And what did you do? Did you report it to the police on site? Dr. Rowley has to answer that because if he was offered in the same way as Minister Maraj, former minister, he should now make a report to the police that there were two businessmen and entrepreneurs in the party offering him services. He should do that if that is the case. But that is to trivialize as well. There's a report that is out. The government has to state what have they been doing about the Cuban medical professionals. What have they been doing about the counter-trafficking unit? What have they been doing about the national task force? Those are the serious issues. And when the U.S. authorities raise a matter in 2020 of senior government officials, look here, government officials, mind you, there's an extension of that sentence, who use their position to impede, to impede, to hinder law enforcement. Those are the serious allegations. You cannot stand in parliament or sit at an unknown location and say, um, that involves UNC people, that involves UNC people. That is, to, that is to make a mockery out of a very serious matter. And I think that um, Dr. Rowley ought to make that issue because if he was in Parliament, he could have been confronted a bit more. But he was, at a, he was as you know, he had COVID for the fourth time. And as I'm on that COVID matter, could I ask, Dr. Rowley attended a, meet, a, a party in Port of Spain in the company of Minister Rohan Sinan and Camille Robinson Regis. In fact, I have on my phone now the guest list at that party, believe it or not. I have the guest list on my phone. The, he was in a party with um, the Speaker of the House, Bridget Anna St. George, her husband, Newman George, Camille Robinson Regis, Foster Cummins, Rohan Sunderland, Marvin Gonzalez, and others in his direct company. And then two days later, declared that he in quarantine for COVID. Why have these persons not been in quarantine as well? They are out balancing all over the place, all over the place in, in office, outside of office, all about in the parliament. And we are told that he quarantined himself, but not um, the other folks 
who were in his direct company. Now, I'm not saying that all 3,000 people, how much people in the party should quarantine, but certainly persons who have been in direct contact with him, they were exposed as well. This morning, some of our colleagues, other colleagues were due to speak here. They did not come here because they, are, they believe that they have been exposed, they're in quarantine, and they decided, no, 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 we, we can't expose our colleagues and members of the press like yourself and so on here. So those are the issues. You have a second question, yes, I Yes. Um, well, it came back to that um, comment you made about the prime minister possibly being approached by people that are known to be in the business. So, I mean, if it is that they are known to be in the business, why aren't, for example, yourself or other UNCMPs also reporting them to the police? No, I'm... <laughs> I must tell you quite frankly, I've never received any service offers and so on, unlike others. Um, but the, the point I'm making is that those are not the issues really. The issues really is the report of the American authority and what are you doing about the issues raised. The, the thing is not to ask everybody in Toronto Tobago if they receive an illicit um, offer. Then the whole of 1.3 million people in Toronto Tobago might have to say yes or no. That is not the issue. That is to trivialize it. The issue is the report of the U.S. authority. What are you doing concerning their serious concerns as to why we cannot have human traffickers charged, arrested, prosecuted, and convicted? It cannot be because somebody in parliament or opposition or something, you have a movelang or some rumor about them. And we can ask the TTPS, are they investigating anything like that? Are they investigating any ongoing investigation? Look here, when Mr. Rowley, Stuart Young, and others said claim that I was linked to gang violence and gang leaders. I went to the police through my lawyer and I have a letter in my possession in which the police say I am not a suspect or I am not in, uh, sus under suspicion for any gang-related matter. I had to go to the police to do that. But what they do is they throw, you know, the mud because they deflect from their own importance, really, in dealing with public policy, in dealing with matters as, as serious as this. They say this one serving that one, this one offering that one, and so on. Which twelve, which they only remember eleven years later. Eleven years later, you remember this. They are making a a farce and a comedy out of a very serious issue of human trafficking. Um, can you um, just give us some more details on closure of these embassy bank accounts and how is it affecting operations in these embassies across the European? The, the issue started in Panama in 2018. It has spread now to Europe and North America. There are serious concerns, and I'm calling on the government. And I want to call on the Minister of Finance, Colm Imbert, who is a seasoned politician himself, to indicate to the population clearly and honestly why have embassies accounts throughout the world been subjected to closure, to threats of closure, it is not only the bank. I called the bank name on Friday and they said I didn't pronounce it. I hope I could. The Deutsche Bank, if that is the Deutsche. pronunciation. Um, I am not Germanic by origin. So if that is the pronunciation, the Deutsche Bank, Kurt knows a lot about these things. Um, why, are that, why is that bank in particular writing to embassies and trying to big institutions abroad concerning matters of uh, money laundering? The Prime Minister admitted in Parliament on Friday that the closure or attempt to close the bank account in Brussels has to do with European Union laws and money laundering. Why have we found ourselves in that position? And this appears now to be, we, we can map it across the world now. Panama, uh, United States, um, New York, Ottawa, Brussels, that we know of so far. We don't know of others, and there may be others. In, uh, there may be issues in Australia, there may be issues in um, United Kingdom, there may be issues in Brazil, there may be issues in South Africa, India, and so on, where we operate missions. We don't know yet. So that what is happening is that the international community is now coming down and clamping down on Trinidad and Tobago. And the financial transactions of the government abroad are now snowballing. And it is crashing. It is coming down like a weight on the government because of their failure to comply with factor and global finance requirements for which we have given parliamentary support. And today, there, 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 there's now a storm brewing internationally 
that is coming to, to crash into Trinidad and Tobago that can render us uh, dysfunctional across the world. And that is the problem. And that is why Dr. Rowley chose on that day. When he finished question three and he reached, reached question six, he had about 10 minutes to consider what to do. And he came with some craziness about UNC MP, UNC this, and if you want to prosecute your colleague. We're not under that. Tell us what you are doing. But the, the, the prime minister of this country is now famous. He's now famous for his inability to answer a question with an answer. I leave it there. Um, with regards to the missing ammunition, um, in recent months, there have been violent crimes being committed and um, shell casings belonging to the regiment have been found. Um, there have been no successful investigations into that matter. Do you think these issues are linked? I believe there's a serious issue in, in the protective services over the management of ammunition and weapons that now with monotonous frequency finds themselves in the hands of criminal elements. And I think a wider, possibly independent investigation need to be conducted on personnel and systems involved in this. It is now not a coincidence that at, at, at several crime scenes, we are discovering that ammunition uh, used in the, in the conduct of criminal activity really belongs to the Trinidad and Tobago Protective Services. And that is a matter when um, Commissioner Erla Herewood Christopher comes to the GSC as early as tomorrow. Some of us intend to raise with her. And it is not enough to say we are investigating and we are looking into this and thing. I think there's a very serious matter. And the missing 500 rounds of 9mm ammunition, that is a serious, deadly matter. And unless we come to some type of resolution on that, I was just bewildered that the police have now admitted that it is missing. I am now bewildered that they have admitted it is missing. And there's a contempt proceeding coming in a few hours in which the court will now demand that the police return the 500 uh, rounds. And if they don't, Mrs. Christopher herself, as head of the police, could find herself fined or thrown in jail as a, as, as a part of a, um, a violation of a court order in contempt proceedings where the TTPS cannot return 500 rounds of ammunition to a private businessman involved in ammunition, a weapon trade, and so on. You cannot. So Mrs. Erla Christopher could one day find herself in jail on this matter as head of the police service. I'm sure that's not the outcome that none of us would like to see. Those are the questions. Thank you. All right. Well, uh, thank you very much once again, um, Trinidad and Tobago, for viewing um, another of the United National uh, Congress's Sunday morning press uh, conference. Uh, we have uh, raised, myself and Dr. Munilal, have raised some very important and pertinent issues affecting the people of Trinidad and Tobago based on the incompetence of uh, the government of Prime Minister Dr. Keith Rowley as it relates to the government's inaction in dealing with the United States Department um, report on, on human trafficking as it relates to Trinidad and Tobago, um, the missing uh, ammunition of the protective services of uh, Trinidad and Tobago, and the unconstitutional approach of the government vis-a-vis -vis the Minister of National Security in conducting an audit into the um, firearms uh, unit and so on within the, the uh, National Security Network and of course the very important issue of the callousness and uh, insensitivity of the government as it relates to the um, corporate manslaughter and uh, criminal negligence which occurred at uh, Paria one year ago and the, the uh, government's approach to the Commission of Inquiry. We hope that the government will take the advice of the United National Congress here this morning in ensuring that there is uh, transparency and accountability in this particular issue and that uh, the government will move forward in uh, raising the bar as it relates to health and safety standards in the work environment. 
and uh, we look forward to continuing to work with the population of Trinidad and Tobago in advancing the issues affecting the people through the work of the United National Congress, whether it is in our Sunday morning press conferences, other press conferences, and in our Monday night forum, and in and outside of the parliament. Thank you very much, my colleague, Dr. Munilal, and stay